it is a system designed to punish the worst offenders in the state. And for an entire year, the Channel 4 I team has been investigating what's really happening behind bars in Tennessee prisons. And what we uncovered led to disciplinary actions on more than 70 inmates, a TBI investigation, a hearing before lawmakers, and questions if a state agency is deleting records of violence inside Tennessee prisons. And it all started with a tip from a crime victim asking, how is it possible that convicted criminals are allowed to do this? Prison's rough, right? You're in a cell all day, the food isn't good, little to no communication with the outside, right? I believe I'm smoking better than everybody. Well, welcome to prison life in the social media age. Drugs, smokes, mounds of snacks, cash, getting tattoos, the freedom to make music, even set things on fire using forbidden technology to show it all off on Facebook. This is the penitentiary. You're back there relaxing, you know what I'm talking about? Relaxing, eating pizza, getting high while you're paying for them to be here. Anybody who sees those videos, they're going to be sickened by it. They're going to be angered by it. And we're not talking about just a few inmates who figured out how to get on Facebook. Not 10, not 20, not 50. A Channel 4 I team investigation found more than 100 inmates in Tennessee prisons with Facebook pages. Their profile pictures taken inside their cells. Pages the inmates are operating from behind bars to communicate with family, friends, fellow gang members, even with inmates in other prisons. I guarantee you that when the commissioner sees this, there's going to be a reckoning, and there should be. You know, these are murderers, rapists, and other convicted criminals, and they appear to be having a pretty good time in prison. And I don't like it, but it's a problem that we face today, and it's something that we work hard on every day. And once you see the videos, you'll see why crime victims advocates like Verna Wyatt are infuriated. What we've uncovered is like a highlight reel of audacity. Like that's the world right there. That's convicted murderer Rivera Peoples. Here's the contraband iPhone he uses to make the videos. Listen to his buddy talk about getting high behind bars. I believe I'm smoking better than everybody. Then he asked Peoples about how much money he's collected while he's been in prison. How much money you got, Bill? A thousand? I got a thousand. I'm a thousand. I'm definitely a thousand. And he's not alone. Here's a photo we found of an inmate holding $200, and another inmate shared the same photo on his Facebook page, just like you would share a picture you liked. But let's get back to the videos. You see me? Peoples and his criminal pals are back. This time, it's daytime in the prison yard, telling everyone on Facebook that life behind bars, not so tough. Between me and you, man, you feel me? This ain't half bad. There's video of inmates watching TV, singing, and rapping. It was so real, it fills me with this nausea. <laughs> but none of that compares to convicted burglar Martez Wright, operating his Facebook page from inside the Shelby County Correctional Center, posting videos of his exploits while in a Memphis jail. First, he shows off what he says is marijuana. Then he talks about the side effects of smoking loud, a slang term for weed. Man, everybody in here on this stupid loud. We all hungry. And to satisfy his munchies, take a look at his spread. Man, we hungry. We finna get ready to eat the feast. Scrumptious items that we get that we eat on a daily basis. What they're doing is breaking the law. They're rubbing everyone's face in it. There's also a real criminal element to all this. The Channel 4 I team examined more than 100 communications and found this. Two inmates in two different prisons having a conversation on the Facebook wall. One saying, I need to get with someone at your prison. Send me your number. And the other inmate posts the number to call. So here are two inmates communicating with each other in two different prisons. Well, it is a problem. Obviously, this is instant communication. Assistant Commissioner Tony Parker is in charge of security in Tennessee's prisons. How can a guy set a shirt on fire without your correctional officers knowing? You have one officer and 128 inmates in a prototypical housing unit. It appears that they have took something and covered up the door. Parker looked at every photo and every video we found.
this has to be embarrassing for you. I, it's something I don't like, obviously. So imagine what the victims of these criminals felt seeing all that. Well, they had plenty to say, and the state took swift action. We're not going to deserve Ms. Sadler lying on her back. Um, her head was bloodied. When Ivan Marino was convicted of strangling and murdering her grandmother, Michelle Elliott thought his days of enjoying life were over. Yeah, when I saw him in court, I figured I'd never have to see him again. Then the Channel 4 I team showed her this, Marino's Facebook page. Despite being behind bars, he's posting updates, commenting on pictures, even showing himself playing the guitar. His profile picture taken inside his jail cell. My eyes started watering, I started shaking, I just couldn't believe I, you know, I could see him again. Convicted murderers, rapists, and other violent offenders enjoying all the perks of social media, including convicted murderer Brandon White, openly showing off two things you can never have in prison, his phone and his cash, 200 bucks. That's not punishment. That is not any kind of a punishment. It's just like just being out on the outside. It's still freedom for them. White was convicted in the murder of Linda Wright's son. We can never communicate again, and he has, he has access to, to being able to communicate with the outside world. And there was no hiding the fact they had phones. White and several other inmates posted their phone numbers. So we decided to call them, including White. Here's the number he posted. Is this Brandon? We tried to call him back, but no one answered. The rest of our calls either went to voicemails or the phones weren't in service. Uh, Menace to Society has use of social media, and that's just wrong. These victims' families say when the criminals were sentenced, they never imagined them watching TV or burying themselves in junk food. Is this too extravagant for a guy to have who's behind bars? But it's obvious the inmate is trying to be flagrant and showing us all this property and all this commissary. Obviously, it's, a, it's an issue. We asked the Tennessee Department of Correction how all of this can be happening while correctional officers are watching. It's not an issue of not enough correctional officers. It's an issue of a nationwide problem that we're facing with, with cell phones and the struggle to stay on top of it. Sometimes the inmates on Facebook even surprise their own friends and family with their freedom. We found several posts with people writing on inmates' Facebook walls, how are you locked up and on Facebook? Every Department of Correction struggles with contraband. It's something that I'm not proud of, uh, but it's, some, it's a reality. I think my first question would be, how is this happening? As soon as the Channel 4 I-Team brought our findings to the state, they immediately launched investigations in 14 prisons across the state, finding 53 cell phones, drugs, and a deadly weapon. Disciplinary actions were taken on 70 inmates for having Facebook pages, and their Facebook pages shut down. Both Marino and White's pages were taken down. It's one thing to see inmates outrageous behavior displayed using social media, but we found innocent people being harassed, even threatened by the technology that inmates aren't even supposed to have. There he is right there. Lisa Thompson thought it was odd that her cousin Eddie Phillips had a Facebook page while behind bars. Hmm. But when he actually called her, she wondered just how much freedom he had. He said that he could get anything that he wanted. And then came the texts. They were harmless at first, but she started getting texts asking if she had friends who would send sexy pictures, then asking for sexy pictures of herself. She pointed out how disgusting that was coming from her cousin, and the response, I'm his cellmate. Your cousin lets me use his phone. And that did it. I said, don't text me again. But the texts kept coming. I want to see you naked. I will send you one of me naked. It was terrible. I, I felt harassed. Her response, stop sexually harassing me. She says she called the warden and the state. Nothing has been done about it. Then she got a call from someone claiming to be an inmate saying Lisa's family needed to put money in a prepaid card or her brother, who was also in prison, would be killed by gangster disciples. Her text, 
please don't hurt him. I will give you $25 next week. The inmate later responded, what did your mom say? I need that green dot money pack card today. She wrote back, stop threatening me. We brought all this to the Department of Correction. Just as we did with all those photographs and video we found of inmates behavior behind bars. A state spokeswoman said the commissioner would not answer our questions, but confirmed that 10 days after we shared these texts with them, this man, inmate Dennis Boykin, was found with a cell phone and admitted to texting Lisa Thompson, but nothing threatening, he said. Boykin is in the same unit with Thompson's cousin Eddie, who was caught with a phone back in January. But guess what? That didn't stop Eddie Phillips, because once he got a new phone, he even texted about that too, writing, got caught with a phone. Do you think that the prisons are taking this seriously enough? No, I don't. He's gonna get me too, and I'm, I'm scared to death. And Norma Pendleton is joining others on the outside who say they're being harassed by inmates through cell phones. Pendleton is divorcing her husband and got an order of protection after he was charged and indicted with busting in her door, hitting her so hard that her front teeth that she was once so proud of were knocked loose. The assault charge sent him back to Riverbend Prison where he was serving time for murder. And that will be the number there. So imagine her surprise when an unknown cell phone number showed up on her phone. And she says her husband was on the other line saying this. Oh, how much, you know, is it going to take for you to drop these charges? Pendleton wants the state to now reinstate the oversight committee for the Department of Correction, saying agency officials don't understand how innocent people are suffering from devices bringing so much fun and freedom to criminals. You know, people are scared. You know, but really, they ain't been in this predicament, you know what I'm saying? They ain't been beat up or hit or, you know, teeth, you know, loosened out of their mouth. I hope he stops calling. Yes, I don't, I don't like it. Listen to what happened to Sandra Forrest, who started getting these text photos from an unknown number. I text back, wrong number. And then he started sending pics from, it looked like a prison cell. The texter says his name is Anthony and sent pictures of a guy in a Tennessee prison uniform. Pictures that show him rolling something in little bags. Two days later, he called my phone. Um, and that's when I labeled his number prisoner of Tennessee, so I wouldn't answer it. And when we called that number. Hello. Yes, I was looking for Anthony. Then another guy came to the phone. Hello. Yes, is this Anthony? No, no, you got the wrong number. Are you guys calling from a prison? No, no, this ain't no prison number, no. And when we pointed out that this was the number that had texted and called Forrest, they hung up. Not only is it scary, it's draining emotionally. Angie Smith knows all too well what it's like to get repeated phone calls from a prison when she became the legal guardian of a little girl whose father is in a Tennessee prison. She at first encouraged him to call from the prison phone. We felt obligated to keep the lines of communication open. Then the calls started coming from cell phones, making demands to bring the girl to the prison for visitation. I didn't like the fact that he said he was friends with killers. So how many times did he call? 400. It was right at 400. She not only showed us the calls, but also the local sheriff and the prison. But what did they say? It, there was nothing they could do. I mean, you know, they're hard to ferret out. They move from cell to cell. Smith also wrote this letter to Commissioner Derek Schofield, writing, with the seemingly endless harassment and no help from the system, we wondered what will happen if he is released. She says she never heard back from the state. A spokeswoman for the Department of Correction says there's no record of the commissioner receiving Smith's letter. The spokeswoman also pointed out cell phones are a problem, not just in Tennessee, but across the country. We deploy a number of tools to interdict, detect, and confiscate cell phones and other contraband. For Smith, when the inmate got out on parole, she says they took action. And I'm not gonna lie, when he got out, um, We've taken some security measures. After our initial investigations aired, I got an interesting call from an inmate inside his cell inside the state's most secure prison. 
What we uncovered led to a TBI investigation and a criminal charge. If Riverbend Maximum Security Prison is so secure, how did an inmate send the Channel 4 I-Team these pictures from inside? How did we have dozens of conversations while he's locked up in here? You and I right now are talking and you're in Riverbend. I'm sitting in my cell on a cell phone talking to you doing this interview. The answer is obvious. Inmate David Faulkner gets cell phones smuggled to him. And we're about to show you how he says he gets them. It all started in September when I started recording conversations with David Faulkner. He sent me pictures of his cell, the prison, his stash, his tobacco, and then this note that gave instructions of how Faulkner was to get another phone. 400 bucks wrapped in plastic, 200 bucks extra for weed. Let me know ASAP before I leave tonight. Signed, Simmons. Who is Simmons? Faulkner says he's a correctional officer. Over the last 18 months, I've probably bought 20 phones from him, probably a thousand packs of cigarettes, probably at least a pound of weed. Hoping that coming forward with what he knows would get him moved out of Riverbend into another prison, Faulkner enlisted the help of his fiance, Sandy Jordan, to give all his information to the State Department of Correction. They basically all just kind of laughed at me. They, they didn't, you know, they didn't feel that there was any credence to this. So Jordan and Faulkner began to work with the Channel 4 I team to gather more information, starting with texts of how to arrange getting a phone inside the prison. A guard was texting me during his shift. When Jordan suggested they meet at her hotel near the prison, the text reply, too close to work, that's way too risky. That's when Jordan made a bold move and recorded the conversation with the guard. I have a lot to lose to do something like this. You take a risk just like I do. I'll be honest with you, it scares me. We both have a lot to lose. And it can be anything I want, phone, weed, you know, anything that he needs, right? Yeah, yeah. The cost for the contraband, $3,000. I said, I don't mind helping him out, but because of what it is, it, it has to cost him because of, of, of the risk that I take. Then another request by text, I want to know what you look like. Jordan responded, and this picture was sent in return. The TBI confirms that's Kevin Simmons, a correctional officer at Riverbend Prison. When the Channel 4 I team brought all this to investigators with the Department of Correction, they contacted the district attorney who called in the TBI. That's when the TBI asked Jordan for her help. I wanted to make sure that they knew that we had this kind of leverage that they needed to act. The TBI confirms to the Channel 4 I team they took Jordan to this hotel in Mount Juliet and she arranged for Simmons to meet her. Inside the hotel, the TBI confirms they gave Jordan $3,000, a cell phone and tobacco to give to Simmons. And Jordan says as soon as the transaction was made, TBI agents moved in. They came into the room as soon as he had the money, placed a gun straight to his head, which was quite shocking to me. Afterwards, Simmons was fired by the Department of Correction. After repeatedly trying to reach Simmons at his last known address, I tracked him down by phone. Simmons denies writing this note and says he didn't intend to deliver the phone to David Faulkner. For now, that's all he will say. Jordan says the TBI has their work cut out for them. I believe they want to get the network within the prison because there's more people involved. Knowing that tax dollars pay for the housing and punishment of these inmates, lawmakers and a district attorney saw our investigations and demanded answers. I was really shocked by what I saw. State Senator Ken Yeager is talking about this and this and this. My biggest concern was what I saw on television, you know, that we just a flagrant, flagrant violation of law. Photographs, video, text messages, all uncovered by the Channel 4 I team, showing Tennessee inmates using social media to communicate with criminals in other prisons, partying and living it up while they're locked up. In one instance, I, th I recall that they actually set a fire. I mean, aren't there people, why, why didn't you catch that? We don't say, you know, that it didn't happen or it couldn't happen. 
Department of Correction Commissioner Derek Schofield and his top staff were called to the subcommittee to answer questions about what the Channel 4i team has been uncovering. There was uh, um, cell phones, drugs, money, unapproved, uh, you know, foods, uh, and, and even some of them were apparently posted on Facebook from inside the prison. And I have a couple of questions. How, how could this happen? How did this, how could this happen? With the advance of uh, cell phones, and that has become more of an issue as in the latter years, and uh, those cell phones have access to internet. Schofield downplayed everything we've shown you. Some of that, depending on what footage you watch, wasn't at TDOC facilities. He may be talking about this video, which we originally reported was taken inside a county facility, but it was posted on Facebook while the inmate was in a Tennessee prison cell. Schofield also challenges our findings of how many inmates were on Facebook. But after we brought our discoveries to the state, 70 inmates were disciplined. Assistant Commissioner Tony Parker also mentioned that in the last four months of 2013, five staff members were arrested for bringing in contraband. It's unclear if that number includes former correctional officer Kevin Simmons, who the Channel 4i team exposed allegedly planning to slip contraband into the most secure prison in the state. The Department of Correction first dismissed our findings and then later called in the TBI, who set up a sting to catch Simmons. He is now charged with felony official misconduct. We get punched in the eye for everything that we don't do just right. But imagine every day, you know, that we supervise those 20 plus thousand offenders in those facilities where things go right. And it's not only this subcommittee concerned about what we've uncovered. Here's District Attorney Mike Donovan. It's disturbing. It's offensive. And State Representative Mike Turner. There's no excuse for that. And somebody's had these roll Somebody needs somebody needs to lose a job over this. This is this is so bad. This is embarrassing. Both asked for meetings with Department of Corrections Commissioner Derek Schofield, and the commissioner wrote this letter to D.A. Donovan, writing he'd love to implement cell phone jamming technology, but the FCC won't allow it. Here's the most interesting part of the letter. While he says as a result of our investigation, 70 inmates were disciplined, the state has deactivated hundreds of Facebook accounts in the past three years, meaning this problem existed years before we discovered it and continues to this day. I want to know how this happens. How does this happen? I mean, there's no excuse you're in, a, in the, one of the most controlled situations out there. And we had questions for Commissioner Schofield as well. In the beginning, he allowed his assistant commissioner to do an on-camera interview with us. But as we continued to air investigations, we found our requests for doing an interview were being denied. So we tracked him down, and we found that he still wasn't ready to talk. We want to utilize our resources. Commissioner Derek Schofield had no problem answering all kinds of questions from Governor Haslam about his budget. And we were there, too, with questions of our own. We can't say, though, if that's the reason why the commissioner didn't appear to be too thrilled to be talking to the media after his budget hearing. I'm going to start by asking some questions about the cell phones. We've been doing a lot of stories about this. I understand. Um, Can we talk about budget today? But i got questions for you as well about the cell phones. Uh, so we'll if you want to we'll ask about, about that, it's fine. We'll do a separate one for you. And we didn't mind to wait to do a separate interview. After all, he brought up something in his budget request about a salary survey for corrections officers. That was key. We had heard repeatedly that the reason so many correctional officers have been busted carrying in cell phones is that they need to make extra money because because their salaries are too low. Because that's something that has to happen in order to get more of the issues under control. I, you make an assumption that uh, more of the issues under control. I think we have our prison system under control. Uh, what we do in the community is under control. Once the budget questions were over, we were ready for our interview. All right, Commissioner, what can we do an interview over here? But it appears we misunderstood. Today he's saying we're doing budget. On the other issue, we'll talk to you at another time. And there goes the commissioner right into the elevator. And the commissioner certainly wasn't willing to talk on camera about what you're about to see. Former wardens came to the Channel 4 I team saying the Department of Correction was deleting records of assaults in order to improve statistics. But in some cases, before those records were deleted, the Channel 4 I team obtained them.
It's October 9th, 2012, and things at West Tennessee State Penitentiary are about to get violent. I was attacked from behind by about three inmates. Watch as a riot breaks out, and former warden Jerry Lester is caught up in the fight. Staff and inmates fall, leap over each other. After the riot is contained, Lester starts to feel pain. Yeah, I wound up having to have surgery for a torn rotator cuff and was unaware of it at the time, but my arm was actually broken as well. But in all the state records of that riot, there is no mention of an assault on Warden Jerry Lester. And there appears to be no record of it. Correct. In fact, none of the inmates involved in the riot were ever charged with assault, instead disciplined for participation in a security threat group, a charge Lester says isn't included in yearly stats of assaults provided to the governor and the public. This former warden says this is just one example of a calculated effort being made by his former agency, the State Department of Correction, to hide assaults on staff and inmates. Do you think we, as the general public, are being told the truth about what's happening in the prisons in this state? Absolutely not. Uh, you're being given a sugar-coated version of what's taking place. And he isn't the only former warden coming forward. I do not think the public knows what's happening in this prison. That's recently retired Deputy Warden Andrew Lewis. Lewis says after spending much of his career investigating assaults in prison, he was told by his warden that he was no longer allowed to classify assaults on internal reports, that the wardens would now review each case and make that determination. Experienced staff knew what an assault on staff was. I knew what an assault on staff was. Lester says he and other wardens were given a clear message from Commissioner Derek Schofield and his upper management. And anything that could be changed to staff inmate provocation, we were to do so. Is it safe to say you were encouraged to turn assaults into something else? Encouraged, if not ordered to. That's the way I felt, you know. I felt like we really don't want the accurate number of assaults reported. These former wardens say the reason is because of the rising number of assaults on offenders and staff. But after wardens started evaluating the cases in late 2012, the numbers dropped. Assaults on staff went from 779 in 2012 to 704 in 2013. Assaults on offenders down from 528 in 2012 to 433 in 2013. All we've actually done in, over the past two years is rename a lot of the incidents so they don't appear as assaults. Commissioner Derek Schofield refused to go on camera to answer our questions. He did send us a statement saying he directed the wardens to evaluate assault cases after a September 2012 audit from the Comptroller's office that urged the state to clarify its policy on reporting incidents, that confusion on the policy could lead to inconsistent reports of incidents. But Lester says the effort instead has been to eliminate reports. Well, records have been purged, different types of incidents have been renamed. And take a look at this. This internal memo dated April 2012 from Jason Woodall, Deputy Commissioner of Operations, shows assault cases reported by staff. After review, 12 of those assault cases were deleted, citing that errors were made in the initial reporting. The Channel 4i team obtained some of these cases from a source before they were deleted. One reads an inmate was hit in the mouth by another inmate and evaluated by a nurse. The handwritten notes on the incident reads, coded incorrectly needs to be deleted. No inmate was charged. Just because an inmate was not charged with an institutional disciplinary offense doesn't mean that you just erase the incident report as if it didn't happen when it really did. Prison watchdog Alex Friedman says none of the cases first deemed as assault and later found to be something else should have ever been deleted. State prison officials are hiding information from the public. They're deleting information, they're deleting records, and the public has a right to know. We sent all of these records to the commissioner for clarification and for further explanation. Again, he wouldn't do an interview, but in his statement wrote, when incidents are found to be incorrect, modifications and deletions are required. 
TDOC has never attempted to cover up assaults or any other incidents. Lester and Lewis both say even the governor hasn't been given the correct numbers of assaults. You have concerns that he doesn't know? Yes. If this does not wake people up and make people understand that the way prison officials in this state are reporting incidents and basically covering up higher levels of assaults, then I'm not sure what it would take.